All right. It looks like most participants have kind of logged in. So I'm going to go ahead and start us off. Okay. So hello again, everyone. Welcome to the last webinar in the 2022 Community Science LI webinar series. My name is Ariel Santos from SeaTuck Environmental Association, and I will be moderating tonight's webinar. The goal of the Community Science LI series is to highlight various community science opportunities around Long Island and how the data accumulated by the public influences local environmental management efforts. The Community Science Webinar Series is brought to you by SeaTuck, Long Island Sound Study, New York Sea Grant, the Peconic Estuary Partnership, and the South Shore Estuary Reserve. SeaTuck is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to conserving Long Island wildlife and the environment. The Long Island Sound Study is a bi state partnership consisting of federal and state agencies user groups, concerned organizations, and individuals dedicated to restoring and protecting the sound. New York Sea Grant represents a statewide network of integrated research, education, and extension services promoting coastal community economic vitality, environmental sustainability, citizen awareness, and understanding about the state's marine and Great Lakes resources. The Peconic Estuary Partnership is a national estuary program that works to protect and restore the Peconic Estuary. PEP staff and partners support monitoring, research, collaboration, and education to address priority issues within the Peconic Estuary and its watershed. The South Shore Estuary Reserve Program guides the preservation, protection, and enhancement of the natural recreational, economic, and educational resources of the estuary through partnerships with a diverse group of stakeholders, including state, federal, and local organizations. Tonight's webinar will cover Long Island mammals with SeaTuck's very own wildlife biologist, Mike Bottini. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on SeaTuck's website shortly after the webinar concludes. Your video and microphones are turned off, but you are free to ask questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. If you don't have a question, but want to share a resource and discuss amongst the group, you are more than welcome to use the chat box. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Mike Bottini. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, we might as well put the first slide up. Um, yep, I'm gonna upload that now. And while that's happening, I'd like to um, thank uh, two colleagues that have been very helpful in launching this campaign. Um, the New York State zoologist, Matt Schlesinger, and uh, the Region 1 fur bear biologist for the New York State DEC, um, Leslie Lupo. Um, many thanks to them for uh, for uh, actually setting up. They they set up a training program for one of the protocols for this survey, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so um, this is the uh, the okay? screen looks okay. Right? Okay. Um, yeah, this is um, limited to the terrestrial mammals of Long Island, so we're gonna we're gonna skip over uh, the marine mammals, and I'm gonna start out with the, the the things that are gonna be of most interest to um, to the people who would actually be involved in this survey. I I, I want to thank you all for your interest in Long Island's wild mammals, and hopefully thank you for your interest in being involved in helping us map the current distribution of wild terrestrial mammals here. Uh, this this multi-year project has two components. Uh, one is to survey small mammals such as shrews, voles, and mice. Um, and that's going to be a live trapping component. It's being led by the New York State DEC and a few colleagues that went through the state trapping protocols. So then the um, the other uh, component of this project is to map the distribution of our larger mammals employing mostly remote trail cameras. And um, they're very popular now. I know a lot of people have them, but we're hoping to divvy up the, uh, 
uh, Long Island into sections that will be adopted by various conservation groups or um, school groups and interested individuals to set out uh, remote trail cameras and monitor them for images of, of key species. So other chance encounters, as long as they are photographed and, and, and of the location is provided would be very helpful for this project as well, including road kills. Again, um, they, they, they would have to have a photo in order to verify the, the actual species. Okay, so this is um, an overview of Long Island. And um, I just wanted to point out that this is actually the largest island in the lower 48. So um, yeah, this is a big project and we're, we're hoping to enlist a small army of, of volunteers to help out with this. And in his 1971 publica publication, The Mammals of Long Island, um, Connor wrote, because this area is coastal and insular and was heavily settled in colonial times, most of the large wild animals were rather quickly exterminated. So this was before conservation laws were enacted. Since then, the populations of many species such as beaver, otter, and bobcat have recovered on the mainland. But being an island with one of the densest populations in the world located where it's closest to the mainland creates a, a bit of a bottleneck and a challenge for terrestrial and semi-aquatic mammals to recolonize suitable habitat here. So that, that is a, a challenge. And um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the animals that are impacted by that bottleneck. Okay, next slide. I wanna point out this excellent publication. It's available to download at SeaTuck's website. And it's based on field work and interviews during the 1960s. So the data in this, uh, this is the last survey of the mammals of Long Island. So this, this data is 60 years old and badly in need of updating. So that's hence the, the, the rationale for launching this project. Okay. Well, we'll start off with this very familiar mammal. This is our largest mammal on Long Island, the white-tailed deer. And the history of deer here, I'm not gonna be able to go over a lot of the, the natural history of these animals. There's just too many species to go through, but I wanna to touch on a couple uh, interesting facts about each one. And one of the interesting facts about the white-tailed deer on Long Island is, is its history. In 1902, naturalist Arthur Helm wrote that Long Island's deer population had declined and was restricted to five square miles on the Great South Bay in Islip and Brookhaven. These were protected by privately owned game reserves and estates in that area. They also survived on Gardner's Island, which was a privately owned estate. By the early 1900s, they decided that the, the herd was so small, they imported deer from, uh, from New England to increase the population on the game preserves. In 1949, the deer population on Long Island was estimated to be 1,500 to 2,000 deer. 60 years later, in around 2008, the estimates rose to 20,000, and today it is nearly double that number on Long Island. Uh, I should also mention that there's two other species of deer that were introduced to Long Island. They're not native to the area. The black-tailed deer was introduced to Shelter Island. I think that was, uh, they were released at Meshomet Preserve back when it was a game hunting uh, establishment. And Sitka deer um, were, were introduced at South Haven County Park on the Carmen's River back when that was also a sportsman's club, not, not owned by the county. And one last thing, I don't know if you've um, noticed the acorn production uh, this year. It's very low and it's, it's going to impact the white-tailed deer, which is a big mass eater, counts on that to build up fat reserves right now to get through the winter. But also a, a lot of other species like wild turkey and some of our uh, rodents, which we'll talk about later. Okay, next slide. 
So this is a photograph of a deer exclosure at Michelinic Preserve. And uh, so deer are excluded from the area on the right and they have free reign to the area on the left where the people are. And our large deer population has resulted in, in browsing impacts as you can clearly see here in the forest understory. When you don't have a deer exclosure, even if you spend a lot of time in the woods, that damage uh, to the understory is very incremental from year to year, and it's very easily overlooked over time. Um, so we're looking at um, actually establishing some more deer exclosures on Long Island just to as an educational tool to, to educate people that this is a, a serious problem. So um, the impacts are um, forests on, uh, have to deal with uh, forest biodiversity, forest regeneration, and for some species that are understory habitat specialists. Some examples are the whippoorwill and the oven bird that are forest understory nesters. Okay, next slide. Um, lacking natural deer predators, controlling the deer population has proven to be very challenging. You might be wondering why I photographed uh, some venison uh, marinating in, in a special concoction of spices and sauces. So re recreational hunting has proven to be ineffective in controlling deer numbers. Coyotes um, actually have not checked the deer population in places like Connecticut. So that, that isn't working either. Although they do zero in on fawns in the, uh, in the spring and they do scavenge a lot of roadkill carcasses in, in lots of areas in the Eastern seaboard. Uh, as opposed to having to chase down the deer. So there's plenty of that around, especially uh, out here on the South Fork. So one interesting idea by a colleague of mine was to change the outdated uh, FDA regulations that prohibit the sale of venison to create a cottage industry on Eastern Long Island and an incentive to increase hunting pressure here. So, um, Hasn't gone anyway, but I think that's something that we should look at. Next slide. So the this is a very familiar animal to, to most people throughout Long Island. And this is actually two species that were found on Long Island. The one on the left is the uh, very rare and endangered New England cottontail. That was the dominant cottontail found on Long Island many years ago with habitat changes due to clear uh, cutting the forests and, and creating farmland, the, uh, the Eastern cottontail kind of took over. That's a little more aggressive and it can now compete the New England cottontail. However, we do have some excellent New England cottontail habitat remaining in, in particularly in the Montauk Peninsula. And although some colleagues at DEC have um, mentioned that they did try and do some surveys looking for New England cottontails on Long Island. I haven't seen anything published or written up about that. And that's worth looking at um, again. And these two are um, one of the problems with surveying the New England cottontails. You would need to do genetic uh, work to distinguish between the two species. They look very much alike in the field and even in hand. All right, next slide. Uh, this species, the Virginia possum, uh, this is a southern species. It's an example of an animal like some of the bird species we have here now, like the, the, the cardinal. Um, it's uh, this did not arrive on Long Island until the 1890s. And um, right away, this was, uh, uh, the, 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 some bounties were put on the population, but that did had no impact on it and it continued its range expansion. It's now widespread through Southern New England uh, and, and Southern New York. It has an opposable inner toe on the hind feet for grasping 
branches and climbing. It's a, a marsupial or pouch mammal and the most primitive mammal in North America. And it has this um, habit, doesn't use it too often according to the literature, but it will sometimes enter a coma-like state and feign death when threatened or the so-called playing possum. All right, next slide. It has a very uh, unusual birth process. After a 13-day gestation period, the young are born. They pass through the birth canal and then climb into a pouch where the teats are located for a 60-day lactation period. The entire litter, when first born, up to 10 young, can fit on a teaspoon. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to get into the carnivores. We have nine species, and the first two sh I'm showing here are the weasels, uh, commonly referred to as the weasels. The one in the upper right is the short tail weasel. Um, that's a more northern species. The one in the lower left is the long tail weasel, and that's the more common species as per Connor's uh, publication from his work done in the 1960s. More recently, we've learned that um, this, well, this sexual dimorphism, meaning that the males are significantly larger than the females in each of these species, so that the female of the larger long tail weasel overlaps with the male of the smaller short tail weasel. And so there's been a lot of misidentifications apparently, and they're relying on genetic testing for this as well um, to, to get it to species. Uh, so this, um, I have only seen two long tail weasels on Long Island, both were road kills, and that was about 30 years ago. So this is a very, we do, have some some of these on Long Island, but the distribution and status of this species is unknown. Next slide. Another member of the mustelid group, along with the weasels, this is the mink, and this is a um, not quite as aquatic as the river otter. Uh, it's not as adept at swimming, but it does like to forage around in riparian areas, so really shallow uh, pond and, and uh, creek edges in both saltwater and freshwater. This is another species that um, hopefully we still have on Long Island. Uh, I'm a little concerned with this in that in doing some year-round uh, remote camera work at otter sites, I expected to, to see some images of mink, but I've yet to capture an image of a mink on Long Island. I did see two mink in Sag Pond in Southampton. Uh, again, that was about 30 years ago. Uh, they were too young, um, right on the edge, in, in, running, darting out of the Phragmites. Okay, next slide. And this is the largest mustelid on Long Island. This is the uh, North American river otter. It's three to four feet in length from the nose to the tip of the tail, so quite large. And um, we have a lot of data on this. So um, I, I'm pretty sure a lot of you in the audience have actually uh, helped out with the, uh, with the Long Island River Otter Project surveys. There's one done in 2008 at first documented River Otter home ranges on Long Island. And we did a follow up 10 years later in 2018 and learned that the, their, their distribution on Long Island nearly doubled in that decade. Next slide. So as I said, we have a lot of data on this in terms of its distribution. So it's not a high priority, but I would like to point out that uh, we updated this map in uh, just this year. We have three locations on the South Shore. So they just recently gotten over into the South Shore watersheds. And I expect there's a lot of great habitat there. And I expect them to um, hopefully uh, expand their range along the South Shore. 
And with that, we, um, we've noticed that uh, we're starting to document roadkill sites. So roadkill is the major bottleneck in their uh, recolonization of all the suitable areas on Long Island. And we're working on some mitigation projects. First one was a success at Little Sea Tuck Creek on the South Shore. And we're working on permits to do another one um, at Mill Pond on West Main Street in Oyster Bay, the number one roadkill site on Long Island to date. Next slide. Uh, the striped skunk until recently was part of this um, uh, weasel group, mustelid group, but it's been kicked out into its own little uh, niche in the lineup. Uh, so let me see if I could find my notes here. Okay, yes. Um, it's a slow moving omnivore, but a good mouser. It was once widespread across Long Island and its decline began in the late 1890s. By 1990, 100 years later, their range had shrunk to uh, Manorville. The, some suggest the decline was related to a poison, Paris green poison, that was used to control the Colorado potato beetle. But this doesn't really explain its absence from some areas, for example, Montauk, where as recently as the 1960s, skunks periodically raided the garbage cans at the Hither Hills campground. So, and as I said, uh, its, its status and distribution on Long Island is unknown. All right, next slide. The raccoon, uh, along with the skunk, it, its common names are Algonquin derived. And this roughly trans, raccoon roughly translates scrubs and scratches with hands. And its scientific name, Procyon Loter, means dog-like hand washer. This is related to its behavior um, of probing the edge of wetlands, ponds and streams with its hands, which are loaded with touch receptors. It has a great tactile sense and it, it, it can feel around in the dark in search of food. In captivity, this fixed motor pattern gets transferred to a habit of washing its food in its water. Um, and uh, there's a, a, a section in the book Rascal with his pet raccoon. He, he, he ended up one day giving it uh, cubes of sugar. And the raccoon, of course, took it to the dish pan where it's got its water supply, tried to clean it up before eating it, and it disappeared into the water. This species is widespread on Long Island. It's well adapted to urban and suburban life. However, during, during the late 1800s and early 1900s, they were scarce or non-existent in some large areas of Long Island. This is a result of the popularity of coonskin coats during that period. Today, our Long Island raccoon population uh, is quite high, has no natural predators, and it is impacting certain species such as a, a various turtles. Uh, it, it's impacting their nesting success. It's very good at digging up uh, the eggs in the, in the turtle nests in some areas. It'll be interesting to see how that changes with the arrival of coyote. Predation by the coyote on the raccoons may have a very limited impact, but its presence, in other words, once the coyote starts marking a territory, that may squeeze the raccoon out of suitable territories for the zone and result in a greatly diminished population. So essentially, it's out of balance um, with the environment out here. And the same can be said, next slide, for um, one of the foxes. This is the gray fox. This was the, um, the dominant fox on Long Island in the early days. And it's been replaced. This is a southern species, it, but it was, it was found here uh, originally on Long Island been replaced by more northern species, the red fox. But just to point out a couple of things about the gray fox, here's another species that we have no uh, information about its status and distribution on Long Island. And ironically, it's allowed to be trapped on Long Island, which is um, something that we need to address. 
we assumed, we meaning uh, most wildlife biologists and naturalists on Long Island, assumed this had been extirpated many years ago. But a roadkill showed up, um, I think that was in 2002. And uh, we realized that was, there were a number of still um, surviving in the Manorville area. Um, the, the distinguishing feature of this animal is its uh, black stripe on the, on the uh, tail, ending in a very uh, predominant and easily seen black tip. But notice that it does have a lot of red coloration on the side. So um, the, the real key is to get a good view of that tail. Next slide. And this is the red fox. This was taken at Sunken Meadow State Park and it's in its winter plumage. So it's gonna look a lot different. Uh, it, it, it oftentimes people think it has the mange, which it does get, but um, it's just its summer coat, which looks more leggy and skinny. And the key features for the red fox for ID are um, the black socks, which are not very easily noticed from a rear view. It's mostly side and front view. Uh, the black behind the ears and the white tip tail, which is visible in this photograph, but easily overlooked as well. Next slide. And here's a female in its uh, summer coat and you can see a lot of gray um on the on the, the main flank of the of the animal but you can still even with the pups you can see the the black behind the ears and they have you can see the little white tip on the, the tip of their uh, tails so this is a there's a saying that the red fox is the most efficient mouse trap ever designed they're excellent mousers and this animal goes through a boom and bust cycle on Long Island uh, because it, it's a meso predator. There's no apex predator that's going to control its numbers. And just like the raccoon, controlling the density of red foxes on Long Island might not be a direct thing like predation. It could just be avoidance of the coyotes as they establish their territory. And um, the red fox then is squeezed out and, and, and its numbers um, naturally diminish just in terms of available habitat without um, encountering coyotes all the time. Next slide. So I get a lot of um, photographs emailed to me um, from probably quite a number of you out there in the audience. Uh, it's something I really enjoy, you know, what is this animal? And so right now you should be able to look at this and tell me what species that is on the left. Uh, this is a uh, several month old red fox pup. And um, it's got the white tip tail. And then on the right is a coyote pup with the black tip tail. So um, I just got a message from Frank Cavado at the South Fork Natural History Museum saying that a roadkill gray fox was turned in in 2008. Okay, next slide. So here's another new animal on the scene here, the, the Eastern Coyote. And it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating story. I'm not gonna go into it in this because I wanna get through some other species, but um, uh, essentially the, the extermination of, through bounties and hunting pressure on the, on the wolves in, on, in the East so, so, so Canada and uh, the New England area in New York and right down into the South created a vacant niche in the ecosystem. And coyote, the Western coyote started dispersing um, eastward and actually northward. And same thing happened in, in uh, southern, southern Canada out west and even into Mexico. So they dispersed in, in, in all directions, they expanded their range. 
And when they were moving eastward, um, because there were very few coyotes at this time moving eastward and uh, the, the breeding population of wolves was very low, there was some chance interactions between the two and they ended up um, interbreeding the, the western coyote and the gray wolf. So the eastern coyote took on some aspects of wolves and the main one that we notice today is is their size. So they're significantly larger than the western coyote. And you can see there's actually a little overlap between the eastern, a large eastern coyote and a small gray wolf. Next slide. So it, it was, when, when I was studying ecology as, a, as, a, as an undergrad at St. Lawrence University, my professor was studying this new animal that came down from Canada across the St. Lawrence River and, and was in Northern New York, but he didn't have the sophisticated lab techniques back then. This is the 1960s and 70s to do uh, genetic work. And they assumed that the Western coyote had interbred with domestic dogs and they called it a koi dog back then. And now we know that the Eastern coyote is about two thirds Western coyote genes, quarter wolf and 10% uh, or so domestic dog. So what is this animal? Um, it's a fascinating story to follow. It's, it's still unfolding as I speak. And some colleagues are saying, wait a minute, you know, we, we should consider this a new species. And of course, the definition of the species is in a, a group of animals that can't interbreed with other species. So we, we, we broke the rules, but that's, that happens a lot um, in, in science. Nothing's black and white. And it's, a, it's, it's, an, it's evidence of evolution, basically. Okay, next slide. Oh um, yeah, okay. I'll get I'll get to this. The, uh, there's another thing I wanted to mention about wolves, but I'll do that at the end. So moving on to the uh, the rodents, we have 12 species on Long Island, and this one is a meadow vole. It looks um, like a, a real chunky animal with a short tail. And uh, let's see, next slide. So. We, the two species are the pine bowl and the meadow bowl. Um, the meadow bowl, in my experience, is more common. And the, the distinguishing feature between the two is the tail length. So one inch or less is the pine bowl. And greater than one inch would be the meadow bowl. And the meadow bowl is the one you're going to find commonly in, um, uh, let's see. So that would be like in salt marshes and whatnot. And uh, this is the one that's responsible for a lot of damage to gardens. It's just a little beech sapling that it ate over the it ate the roots over the winter. So they're somewhat fossorial or they, they live in tunnels underground. And you can find their pathways above the surface of the earth, but through the grasses and meadows. Okay, next slide. So Ariel, am I at the 10 minutes ago? Okay. Yep. Um, okay, this is a white-footed mouse, and Connor claims this is the most widely distributed mammal on Long Island. So I'll move through these fast because these are the animals that um, mostly we're going to track through the, the, the live trapping protocols. Okay, next slide. This is an animal that only found once. I found this animal in the winter in January in the Walking Dunes area of Montauk. And uh, this is a meadow jumping mouse. They're hibernators. They hibernate for six months of the year and they're very nocturnal. So yeah, very, very elusive, very hard to find. And um, really cool looking animal. Next slide. And we have two species of rat. This is the Norway rat, rat. and, and um, you know, we think of rats as associated with, with barns, with human, human refuse, with human structures. But in my camera trapping work with the river rod projects, I found them, found them really everywhere in the middle of like Mishomic Preserve. Um, they're quite ubiquitous. 
Next slide. The other species, by the way, is the black, the black rat. And the black rat was first introduced to uh, to this area, and later on, the Norway rat was introduced. They're both introduced species, and the Norway rat outcompeted the black rat. So that's now the common one in the area. The chipmunk also has a um, interesting distribution on Long Island. For example, the chipmunk was not ever found on Shelter Island. And uh, it wasn't until someone introduced it there, they took a liking to it uh, in their cabin upstate and brought some back and released them. And they're all over um, Shelter Island these days. So that happened back in the 1980s, that release. This is a hibernator that, that will awaken at times in the winter to feed in its underground larder. Next slide. And this is an amazing animal. This is the, uh, the southern flying squirrel. It's found all over Long Island, including in the uh, in Queens and Brooklyn, as long as there's some forest parks around, forested areas to live in small parks. And it hadn't made it over to the South Fork. So the the, the Shinnecock Canal was a, was, a, uh, was a barrier to it. And it was first photographed in Noyak in 1998 on South Fork, probably transported over by people who, who you know, had a problem with them in their attic in Hampton Bays and released them on this side of the canal. Next slide. And uh, it's not a, it doesn't actually fly, but it's an incredible glider. It can glide apparently up to 50 meters. And it has this membrane called the pentagium uh, that it can extend out from its, from its front feet and hind feet and, and create a nice uh, wide surface. It's a very lightweight animal. And um, I actually, kept one when I was working for New Hampshire Autobahn uh, during a cold spell in the winter, it had been injured. And it was unlike, unlike a lot of squirrels that are kind of um, a little bit neurotic, maybe as the way I would describe them. It was a great housemate and a beautiful animal. And you can tell this is very, um, they are in most of our neighborhoods on Long Island, but you might not be aware of them. They're very nocturnal. And one of the uh, indications of a nocturnal animal are those large bulging eyes. Next slide. And of course, we all knew about this many years ago, Rocky the Flying Squirrel and his adventures with Bullwinkle the moose. Um, but I think most of us probably thought this was a made up character and not actually based on a real animal. Next slide. And here uh, people have sort of adapted a little bit of a flying squirrel Pentagium look and are doing some crazy stunts jumping off cliffs. Next slide. The gray squirrel is our common squirrel um, found all over Long Island. And this is another animal that's gonna have a tough time this winter with the lack of um, nuts. So very poor mass production this year. Next slide. And I threw this in because this is a kind of a mystery to us. Uh, the red squirrel is found in conifer forests as opposed to the gray squirrel, which is in deciduous forests. And um, the red squirrel, we have this huge area of pine barrens and there are no red squirrels here, no records of red squirrels here, yet they're to the north of us and to the west of us and to the south of us. Next slide. The groundhog is another species that I think has been moved around by nuisance trappers. Um, this was not on the South Fork when I moved here in 1988. It wasn't found east of the Shinnecock Canal. And it's, it's now quite prevalent out here. Next slide. This is the muskrat and looks a lot without scale. It looks very much like a chunky meadow bowl. So, um, but it's much larger and you can't see the, the unusual scaly tail. This time, uh, this was taken in the spring and when they're, after a diet of, um, of um, root stalks all winter, they're dying to get some fresh greens and they're very actually kind of aggressive. They, they won't budge when they find a nice patch of green stuff. 
and have actually actually had one uh, rush at me and try and bite my uh, boot in this, at, at that time of the year. Next slide. So this is a, a semi-aquatic animal um, associated with riparian areas. And one of the things when you see this swimming, I get a lot of mistaken IDs. People think it's a river otter. Look for that tail. They have a habit of lifting their tail completely out of the water sometimes when they swim. And unlike otters, they won't periscope where you can see their whole head and the neck sticking out of the water. Next slide. And this is one of their classic lodges. Actually, on Long Island, they, they, they have these beaver-like lodges, but there's no sticks. It's all herbaceous stuff. This is an actual lodge where a family group will reside in the winter. They also have much smaller 12 to 18 inch diameter lodges as feeding stations that you could barely, I don't even know if you could get two muskrats inside one, but they, they'll feed in the cover of those feeding stations. Next slide. And the beaver, um, so several beaver have made it to Long Island. None of them have made it to establish a breeding population. This was trapped out of Long Island back in the 1700s. It was so valuable. It was, it was nickname was this, it was soft gold. Um, a single beaver showed up in East Tampa in 2006. This is its second lodge. The first one was destroyed. And then this one was subsequently ripped apart. And the beaver then relocated to Fresh Pond to the hills 10 miles to the east. That was four years later. And it was last seen in August 2012 at Fresh Pond. I have some photos of that. Next photo. Uh, so this photo on the left, a uh, healthy looking middle-aged beaver. This is one, it was, it was very close to Fresh Pond Hit of Woods. And uh, some years later, uh, on the right is a photo taken of it crossing Fresh Pond Road heading to Fresh Pond Amagansett. So it had abandoned Fresh Pond to the hills. My guess is that it was its last chance to find a mate and died of old age soon after this photo was taken. Very bony looking uh, at that point. They can live to be around nine to 11 years in the wild. Next slide. Here's some of the work it did in Scoy Pond. And the beaver is actually, um, is considered kind of a keystone species. So it modifies the environment and attracts a lot of other animals. And one of the interesting things is that it attracts, when it, when it floods an area and a lot of the trees along the shoreline die from the flooding and the inundation, uh, great blue herons move in there. One of the one of the most popular great blue heron rookeries or nesting areas are, are um, a, a beaver beaver ponds, and we have no great blue herons nesting on Long Island. Yet they nest to the north of us, the west of us, and the south of us. Um, however, although this created a lot of good nesting habitat for great blue herons, they never moved into Scoy's Pond. Next slide. And this is a beaver swimming. Very difficult to distinguish from even the muskrat uh, or river otter, even though this is four feet from nose to tip of tail and, and weighs up to uh, like 75 pounds. So it's way, way bigger than a muskrat, but you don't have any sense of relative scale when you see it in the water. Next slide. This is our smallest mammal. So white-tailed deer is the largest. And uh, this is the mask true. I don't know how it got that name. Um, it's, uh, I don't see a, an obvious mask on it. So these are um, really fascinating creatures though. This, they, they, um, they can use echolocation, the shrew. We have two species of shrews the mass shrew and the short-tailed shrew. I have never seen a mask, a masked shrew. Um, but they, but Connor did find them. And uh, uh, I have found the, the other species though. So um, let's see. 
Uh, Connor actually says that, okay, as I found, the mask shrew is rarely seen, although it is quite possible that this is the most numerous mammal on Long Island. It's found in just about every habitat here with sufficient ground cover. And it's an insectivore, but it eats lots of other things in the soil community. Next slide. And this, and this is the, the common shrew species, the short-tailed shrew. And you, you'll actually find this, and if you do, uh, get a photo and send that in on their iNaturalist site. Um, what happens is predators like coyotes or red foxes will catch these, and they have a distasteful um, secretion that uh, it uh, causes the, the, the fox or the coyote or other predator to drop it. And, um, and they will often leave their scat right next to where they drop it. So in this case, I actually noticed the, the coyote scat first. And then, um, then I noticed the, the uh, short-tailed shrew nearby. The fascinating animals, they echolocate. This particular shrew species has a... Uh, a poison gland in its mouth and the saliva with the, it, it, the saliva is poisonous and it can immobilize prey as large as a metal bowl and then um, and and store them, capture and store them. Next slide. I think we're getting close to the end of the line here. So um, we're into the into the ones that I had I, I'd like to talk about, but um, these are these are going to be components of the small mammal survey. So this is a this is one of our mole species, the eastern mole. Next slide. And this is the star-nosed mole. Next slide. And this is mole sign. So moles get a lot of bad press, uh, in my experience. They're often blamed for ravaging gardens, and that is the vole with a V, the vegetarian. Um, of the two. The moles are insectivores and they're very good for your garden. They eat a lot of grubs and other other things in the garden. They won't bother your plants. They do tunnel like this and some people get all freaked out about having these scars on their beautiful lawns. Um, but uh, I think I think we need to um, make an adjustment in our attitudes here on what I sometimes call Lawn Island and, uh, and, and, and just, just enjoy the fact that you have a healthy soil community with, uh, with moles in it. Next slide. And the bats. So um, the, the, uh, there's a number of people doing some great work on bats and on Long Island. Sea uh, Tuck has a big project. We'd like to know if you if you notice bats and where they are, you can report them on a bat survey. This is a silver head bat I found in a uh, artist's studio in Springs. And um, one thing that Connor mentions that we've realized is not actually correct. Connor mentions that there's no caves on Long Island, so there's no hibernating bats here on Long Island. But more recently, we've learned that where houses are built close to the water, which is quite common on Long Island, and you can't put a full basement in. The crawl space mimics the conditions in terms of temperature and humidity of a cave. And we're finding that bats are hibernating in crawl spaces and actually even emerging in the middle of the winter on warm nights and feeding on moths that are also active on warm winter nights. So pretty interesting stuff. Okay, next slide. All right, so so Ariel, in the interest of time, um, maybe go to the um, uh, next couple slides until we get to, yeah, okay, hold on to this one. I think this is, we're getting to the last three or four. So the bobcat was exterminated through bounties on Long Island and it's now has it be, with with conservation laws the bobcat has rebounded populations have rebounded but as I mentioned earlier there's a bottleneck it's very difficult for it to get over to Long Island 
the, and in New Jersey, they did a, re a successful reintroduction in 1978. Now, their home ranges vary quite a bit. That this is the average home range size, but it, if you have a lot of prey, they can live in a small area. And I think it's worth considering uh, doing a reintroduction to Long Island. And we'd have to do a feasibility study and whatnot, but it's worth considering because we have a dearth of apex predators. And um, this might be one that could survive on Eastern Long Island, for example, in our central pine barrens. Next slide. Grizzly bear, I mean, sorry, the black bear was on Long Island. Um, and oh, that's another one that's actually recovered and is down in, in, in Westchester County. Next slide. But I'm, I'm not saying that that's really suitable for um, uh, re, uh, relocation onto Long Island. So um, an interesting thing about the wolf, we did have wolves on Long Island when it was first settled. They were quickly eliminated through the bounty system. And just last year, 2021, a coyote hunter shot what he initially thought was a very large coyote in New York State. And when he got it in hand and weighed it, it came in at uh, 75, I think it was 75 pounds. And he started thinking that maybe I killed a wolf. And the DEC did some tests on it and said, no, no, it's a coyote. It was, the tests were redone at another lab and confirmed that the animal killed was a wolf, not a coyote. So that's uh, really fascinating. I'm not sure where that was in New York State, but it wasn't way up in northern New York State. It was sort of mid-eastern New York State, mid-eastern. Okay, um, next slide. And uh, this little animal, this is a mustelid that you can, you can make out on the mid left of the screen. Thank you, Ariel. Um, typical weasel profile. This is a fisher that was photographed in the Bronx. And um, again, uh, when, I was, when I was actually in graduate school studying at uh, Antioch in Keene, New Hampshire, the fisher had just shown up in southern New Hampshire. Uh, so it was another fur bearer, very valuable pelt that was eliminated from much of its range in North America during the fur trade era and was really slow to recover. And here we have one uh, down in the Bronx. So they're very close by in, West, in, uh, in Connecticut and um, uh, Westchester County. Wouldn't it be interesting if that showed up on Long Island? That would be, you know, fascinating. So this is a, a squirrel, squirrel and porcupine specialist. We don't have porcupines on Long Island, but we have lots of squirrels and many, many rats. Okay, I think that's it. And uh, yeah, that's it. A little thing about what the species are. Okay, so... Um, we can go to, um, Ariel, do you want to explain a little bit about the iNaturalist site? Do you have time to do um, Well, maybe we'll go through the questions and then okay. just so if people need to hop off and then I could yeah. briefly go over that once those are done. So we have four questions in the Q&A. One from Susan that says, what number of deer would be the target here on Long Island? Um, so that's going to vary from various sections of Long Island. And I don't have the, the answer to that off the top of my head. Um, but the, um, it, it's, there is a number. And the problem is, uh, in certain locations, they hired sharpshooters to get down to that number. But then they, you know, Go there, Mary Ray, Ray, and that 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 number. You know, the next next year, the the, the surviving does are having triplets. So, yeah, it's it's. We need something that is more um, of a sustainable thing, and the only thing I so recreational hunting. You get your two deer, you fill the freezer, you're done. If we create a small cottage industry, I mean, I have a lot of a lot of friends and neighbors that. 
um, are very interested in buying venison, but he can't buy venison. So there's a there's a, a guy in my neighborhood that uh, has a nuisance deer permit, and he's, he gives us venison, and we give him a six pack. We do a barter system. But there's a lot of people like him that would love to uh, make some money and be out in the woods much of the year um, hunting deer. Uh, ben, before we go to the next question, um, I would just like to point out before people start leaving that uh, we're going to have another uh, Zoom program with a colleague of mine who is a specialist in setting up and monitoring remote camera traps for wildlife study. And um, she's actually published a book. Her name is Janet Pesataro and uh, amazing stuff. And anyway, we'll be announcing that. And that might help out some of you that are, are thinking of getting involved in this study and, mon and monitoring a uh, trail cam course. Okay. Great. And our next question is from Melissa. She would like it if we could address the bear sighting in Bohemia. The bear sighting? Have you heard of this? No. In, uh, there was a news article about a bear sighting on a ring camera at someone's home in Bohemia, but there was no evidence found by anyone who looked in the area. So it's not sure. It's not, we're not sure if it's a hoax or not. Or a doctored image. So we we you know we we uh, I'm I'm a part of the Long Island Coyote Study Group and we do get a lot of trail cam images for the coyote um, and uh, just the last one we got we we looked at the temperature data and one of my colleagues Maureen Dunn from SeaTuck actually looked at what the what the uh, temperature was recorded that day at a local airport very close to where. The coyote was supposedly photographed and it just didn't match up at all. So we have to be careful about that. So that would be um, pretty unusual. <laughs> okay, our next question, um, also from Melissa, how do you think the single beaver arrived out east? Oh, good question. So Many years ago, when I, when I finished the first otter survey in 2008, I had a cluster of otter latrines documented in the Greenport area, Greenport and, and Shelter Island, and then, a, and then a 40 mile gap westward to the next set of latrines. And I was wondering, that was kind of, was kind of unusual. So I started wondering, is it possible that Otters are coming over from Connecticut via the uh, Fishers Island, Plum Island archipelago. Otters are great swimmers and they could swim across the Long Island Sound from any point. Uh, its widest point is 20 miles. That's like a three hour swim for an otter. But they're adapted to catching creatures underwater and, and they have special adaptations to their eyes for that that then makes their eyes very poor for long distance vision in the air. So I don't think that they can detect land masses more than six or seven miles away. Um, and, the, and the longest open water crossing is around seven miles. So anyway, I went to Fisher's Island. I got funding to survey Fisher's Island from the conservancy there. And every place I looked, I found, I found as many otter latrines on Fisher's Island, which is tiny, as I found on Long Island in 2008. So um, the other thing I found on Fisher's Island was that coyotes had made it the, the two mile swim over from the mainland. And then I talked to the, the director of the museum, there, the, the nature museum, and I found out that beaver occasionally made it over to Fisher's Island, but there's no running water there. So they, they just stopped, rested and fed and then moved on. So I asked the um, biologists who monitor Plum Island if they had in, any information on um, otter, beaver and coyote. And I learned that there was some feeding sign on Plum Island at one point. 
but they could not find the animal, so fed and moved on. Again, no running water. And I, I think the beaver used, uh, that, that's the route the beaver used to get over here. And it's done that several times. So it was a roadkill beaver in uh, Orient not too long ago, within the last six or seven years. But good question. Yep. Awesome, thank you. Oh, and river otter tracks were found by one of the biologists not too long ago on Plum Island. Yeah. Awesome. David would like to know if or when will coyotes make it to East Hampton? Well, we already had a resident coyote um, back in 2011, I think it was first photographed by a farmer in uh, the Wainscott Sagaponic area. Del Cullum got a couple good photographs of it some years later. Um, so it, it was moving around in the um, Wainscott Sagaponic. It was a sighting of it crossing the, the turnpike uh, just south of Sag Harbor. So it, it moved through the Long Pond Greenbelt and was, it seemed to be heading over to Skellinger's Game Farm where there's, there's a lot of food sources there. Um, but it never found a mate. And um, I did some survey work in that area about uh, four years ago, and I couldn't find any sign of uh, coyotes. Thank you. Our next question is from Evan. And the question is, is there any effort or plan to use environmental DNA as a way of assessing mammal biodiversity on Long Island? Uh, no, there's no um, effort to do that as part of this survey, but I, I noticed that um, some school teachers, I've run into some school teachers with their students who were sampling water in a pond and um, they were going to go through that technique to determine all the different things that were living in the pond. Thank you. I have a next question from Susan. Would the fishers be susceptible to secondary kill by ingesting rodents poisoned by rodenticides, similar absolutely. to what happens to birds of prey, owls? Yes, absolutely. So, so yeah, these are these are um, these any of the the apex predators, including the river otter. Um, yeah, they they as the toxins move up the food chain, they get concentrated. And river otter and mink are used by the DEC to monitor remediation projects because they're non-migratory, uh, unlike the osprey, and they reflect the water quality of the riparian area that they're residing in. Yeah, the roadside's big problem. Uh, it's a big problem for a lot of things, including uh, domestic dogs. Uh, you know, I've, no, I've known some friends whose, whose dogs were poisoned by stuff set out by neighbors. Oh, terrible. Yeah. Jose has a question about the long-tailed weasel, and he's wondering if it's still present on Long Island. Yes. Um, uh, let's see, uh, there was a photograph, it was actually a video that Kevin Walsh got within the last, within the last five years anyway. Um, he's a teacher and he's very, he was very involved in the River Otter Project and, um, he, by using trail cams and he's, he's a great naturalist. Uh, and, and, and he's, he's one of the people that, that has been uh, helping me out with the surveys. Yeah, he did capture a long tail weasel. Kelly would like to know if there is any evidence of interbreeding with either the rabbit or weasel species. Mm, uh, let me think, no, not that I know of, not that I'm aware of. And I think that would be a huge problem with the uh, endangered species program with the with the New England cottontail. And I haven't heard 
there's a lot of issues, a lot of, um, yeah, it, it's a, a, a managing the, the New England cottontail is a real challenge, but I haven't heard of that issue as a problem, interbreeding with the more common Eastern cottontail. Thank you. So we have Irene, she said, what is to be done about the deer in Nassau County where any hunting is not permitted? She had a deer jump in front of her car in her driveway last week. Hmm. Yeah. We actually have signs up on our roads that get changed every few years with the number of deer collisions. Yeah, it's um, that's a big problem. Um, so as I said, we, 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 we open up as much of our nature preserves as possible to deer hunting in East Tampton, but you know, that does not uh, eliminate the road, the road collision issue. I've, I've had two, two collisions um, in the past six years. Uh, here. Wow. I think the scariest though was I uh, so it's in it's it's it would still be in Suffolk County, but a deer ran from the north side of of uh, Sunrise Highway at Kanekwat State Park, leaped the concrete barrier, which is only like three or four feet tall, into the um, into the uh, eastbound lanes. I don't know. It was a miracle that it made it over without hitting uh, or a car hitting it. That was, that would have been a major pile up. Yeah. Oh, scary stuff. I have a question from Lee. I saw a roadkill short tailed weasel about 10 years ago on Rocky Point Road. How common is it? Um, so my first question would be, how do you know it's a short tailed weasel? Um, like I said in the presentation, there's a lot of overlap and uh, it could have been a young long tail weasel or um, a female long tail weasel. But anyway, it's, it, it's, it's a great sighting regardless of which species it is. So um, where, where was that located? Rocky Point Road. Oh. Okay, it won't exactly where that is. And the question is, I guess, how common is the short tailed weasel? Short tailed weasel, even Connor in the 60s found that extremely rare. Mm. I think the only specimen he had was one he tracked down in a museum. I'm not even sure he, uh, he, he got any sign or trapped any. But yeah, very rare. Very rare. Okay. That's a more northern species. The, sh the short tail is a more northern species. It's also known as the ermine. So that turns completely white with the black tip tail, generally. Uh, wouldn't do that on Long Island. Least there are records in museums of specimens taken here, but um, uh, I don't think Connor found any sign of them. Lee okay, followed anybody? up and said, in the middle of the state property, uh, they measured the tail in relation to the body, which is what really okay. made them believe it so, was the short-tailed weasel. Uh, right. So the, rec the, the last paper that was done on this issue was, was published very recently. And um, I wonder if he's involved in the, in the mammal survey with, uh, because Leslie Lupo told me she thought they had a a weasel in one of the um, live trapping programs. Okay, maybe we can follow um, so, up with you, Lee. Yeah, so what, one of the things we found was that the, um, now with the sophisticated genetic testing, we, there were some mis-IDs over the years uh, and th they had to adjust the range maps. Mm. So the, the physical features that you look at, like what he's mentioning, uh, were not really accurate. Mm. Okay. Our next question. I see lots of tan marmots around. What are they exactly? Uh, those are woodchucks. Yeah, woodchuck marmot, yeah. 
groundhog. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, and it's a lot of common names. Oh, we that that's a great thing though. We we really don't have a distribution map of woodchucks, so that that's a good thing to report on iNaturalist, and we could we could start mapping that. So each species that we discussed will have its own map, and we'll plot the locations. Um, we have to be careful though with uh, the rare species that is still allowed to be trapped, unfortunately. So that would be mink, all the weasels, skunk, and especially the great box. Yeah, we we don't we don't want anyone to 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 use that as a way to go out and trap them. So I'm actually going to take this one question that kind of follows into what you were saying about the iNaturalist and submitting sightings. Uh, Christina would like to know what are the sites to report sightings of mammals covered in this meeting? Um, so generally, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, there aren't any specific sites. We're just trying to document sightings of the mammals we discussed during this meeting, um, wherever you find them across Long Island. So I put the iNaturalist page into the chat. I also put the Community Science LI webpage into the chat and Connor's uh, publication from the CTUC website. And what you do is you click the iNaturalist page link. It'll take you to our project page, Long Island Mammals, and it's ongoing. And it, I brought it back to 2018 up until the current day and it'll continue. So you'll see a lot of sightings that are already there because it shows you what has been submitted from 2018 until now. Um, but you can go in at any time and submit your sighting with a photo. Um, very important. That's the only way you can su submit your sighting in this project. Um, and all you have to do is hit join project at the top right corner of your screen. I believe you do have to make a login, but it's pretty easy just an email, username, password. It doesn't cost anything. It's free and it's super easy to use. And when we have um, another Zoom meeting in the future about this, we can go over maybe how to use that iNaturalist page. Okay. Yeah, that, that's good though, Ariel. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So this, this is going to be a fun project. And I, I hope a lot of you out there, um, you know, will, will uh, chip away at a little part of it. Uh, this is going to be a, a good example of, you know, many hands make, what is it, less work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we really, really wouldn't be able to do this um, without a, a lot of people uh, getting involved. So it's great. And to follow up on that, Michael would like to ask if there will be any help provided during the survey to aid participants in identifying tracks of various mammals. Mm. Yes, um, I, 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 I was thinking about that. Thanks for reminding me, Michael. <laughs> yes, I will be, uh, pl I'm planning to run a series of um, wildlife track and sign workshops. And um, it's, it's uh, something I love to do. And uh, yeah, definitely, definitely we'll be setting that up um, in 2023. Awesome. And I know it's 815. We have two more questions if you guys want to stick around. And then after that, maybe we will wrap it up. Um, from Michael, he asked, was there something that killed deer in, Sag, in the Sag Harbor area? Two died in my yard in the last two summers. Oh, yes, yes. Um, we ran into a lot of that up in uh, up on the North Fork uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I can't remember the name of that disease. Um, someone out there um, remember that? It's, uh, it's not the chronic, I don't think it's the chronic wasting disease. Um, I can't think of it offhand, but yes, uh, I know I know what you're talking about. I was with Jen Murray. Is Jen out there in the lineup? Um, I don't see her, but maybe we can get back to you and follow up. It should be on the DEC website. If you go, if you Google deer disease, New York State DEC, they, it should take you to the page. Okay, thank you. 
Um, Kevin said, wouldn't it make sense to conduct a scientific study to determine the cause of the disappearance of the striped skunk on Long Island? It's really bizarre considering how common they are on the mainland. If the potato beetle insecticide is the cause, couldn't there be a connection to cancer in humans here on Long Island? Uh, we we can't we can't say for sure if there's any connection with the uh, poison used for the Colorado potato beetle, and uh, I don't think that's in use anymore. I'm, I'm not positive about that. And of course, there's, they're using all sorts of pesticides elsewhere. Um, yeah, the you know, I, I, I think it, one of the problems may be that the, the skunk population got so small on Long Island that uh, it, it's going to take a long time to rebuild. Whereas on the mainland, it, it's not it's not um, a situation where there, there's a lot of recruitment from the surrounding areas and you know we have that bottleneck they're not going to get through Bronx and take take this rocks neck bridge over you know it's um it's kind of tricky and we actually have thank you Lisa it's epizootic hemorrhagic disease yeah. yes yes no wonder I couldn't remember it yeah, that's the mouthful. Oh, I, 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 yes, the thing about the skunk, though, is that from reports of colleagues, Jen Murray, Steve Biasetti, they've been kind of like tracking mostly, I think, road kills um, in that that Manorville area, and and I, their feeling is that it's it's slowly expanding its range towards the North Fork and onto the North Fork. So. Okay, we're gonna take these last two questions. I'm gonna switch it up. Are bat houses helpful for the bats? And is it safe for mounting them on houses or is there a better way to assist their habitat? Hmm. Well, I'm not sure that um, uh, that the, the issue with bats is, is uh, bat houses or, or, or habitats per se. Um, I think the issue with the bat population, well, of course, is the, the, the fungus, the white nose fungus syndrome, which is huge. And, um, and then the, the other issue is one that it's an insectivore, right? So it's the same old issue with with a lot of with songbirds and and with a lot of our insects that you know we're a little too quick to uh, turn on the insect sprays and sterilize our properties. Right. I think that's a big problem. Uh, and one thing that I'm very curious about, but I don't think we could backtrack. I always wondered. We we know that DDT was ubiquitous in the marshes on Long Island and actually the whole Eastern seaboard back in the 40s and 50s and 60s. There wasn't banned until the 70s. And, um, you know, what was the impact of that on bats? I've never heard any, any discussion of that or any research on that. But instead of building up, it could have it could have also just wiped out their prey base right okay so i'm going to end on this last question because i think it's a good one to end on um david would like to know if there are any specific ways for schools to get involved absolutely um so what you should do is is, um, is is invest in a good trail cam. And if you go to trail cam pro, they're, they're, they're very used to address, uh, dealing with, with wildlife researchers. And um, the biggest mistake people make is getting a cheap uh, piece of equipment. Uh, you want something that's durable, it's going to last, and it's is gives good gives good quality pictures. So you can you can get a, quite a good trail cam for two hundred dollars, maybe another fifty for some some extras, like a, 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 a 
a case that and a lock device. Um, so, and on Long Island, um, you know, a, a lot of schools you could you could you could find a nice woodlot or um, meadow where you could set up a trail cam. And there's a lot of, you'll be surprised how much stuff moves through at night. And then the kids can, you know, maybe once a month they retrieve the SD card, swap it out, and then review what they have on the trail cam. There's a number of schools on Long Island that, that have already contacted me and they're in a great position. They can actually walk from the school to the, um, uh, Carl's River Greenbelt in one case, which would be, is going to be fantastic. And I think it'd be a lot of fun for the, the kids to, you know, go through the images and be able to identify these animals that pop up on the screen. Yeah, that sounds like a ton of fun. And we will follow up with you all um, in an email tomorrow with all of our contact information. So if there's any questions we didn't get to tonight or um, you need more details about this study, Mike's email will be in there as well. Okay. So it is 823. I think we had some really great questions. This was an awesome discussion. Um, but to respect everyone's time, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up the webinar for tonight. Mm -hmm. I just wanna take a moment to thank our panelists, Mike Bottini, Thank you so much for sharing your time and your knowledge with us. I also want to thank my colleagues from CTUC, Long Island Sound Study, New York Sea Grant, Peconic Estuary Partnership, and the South Shore Estuary Reserve for helping us put together another fantastic year of programs for the Community Science LI series. And finally, thank you all for joining us to learn more about mammals of Long Island. Again, if you have any questions that were not answered today, please feel free to reach out to us. There will be that follow-up email with all of our contact information, all of the links to the resources we shared today, including a link to the recording that will be up shortly after we conclude. So again, thank you all, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your night.